Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Weezy Nuara, an external affairs representative for ISO New England. I cover governmental affairs for the states of Connecticut and Rhode Island, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here to give the ISO New England update. Um, I'm usually working behind the scenes at CLG meetings, but today I'm tasked with updating you on some developments taking place at the ISO and also within the uh, New England Power Pool or NEPOL. Uh, NEPOL is uh, an advisory body, body to ISO New England, uh, representing New England market participants and other stakeholders. For those of you who are new to the CLG, I do see a number of new faces. I know Rebecca went through some of the uh, background on the CLG a little earlier, but I'll give you a bit more. Um, the CLG was created in 2009 to increase communications between uh, ISO New England, the region's grid operator, and those who actually use and pay for electricity, electric rate payers. The CLG is governed by a coordinating committee uh, representing all six New England states, and they set the agenda for four quarterly meetings a year on issues of importance to electric uh, rate payers. And today's topic, um, chosen by the CLG Coordinating Committee, um, the speaker is also chosen by the CLG Coordinating Committee. Uh, it'll be a great topic, no doubt timely, and important to all of you in this room, energy infrastructure projects progressing in Rhode Island. The um, CLG's quarterly meetings consist of a keynote speaker, an ISO New England update, and a panel discussion at the end. And the uh, ISO New England update, in my view, is a great way to provide a glimpse into discussions that are taking place at the ISO and within the NEPOL stakeholder process. So with that, I will uh, turn over, I will turn to my, my first update on the Integrating Markets and in Public Policy Initiative, or IMAP initiative, which is being led by NEPOL. Now, some of you are probably already involved in these discussions, but for those of you who are not, in August, NEPOL launched a formal stakeholder process to identify potential market rule changes within the wholesale electricity markets to accommodate and achieve the state's public policy objectives. Now, the state's public policy objectives are really beyond um, the objectives of the region's wholesale electricity markets. They're um, renewable energy and greenhouse gas reduction objectives. Uh, the region's competitive wholesale electricity markets are, are really designed to maintain reliability through the selection of the most economically efficient set of resources, not necessarily the least carbon intensive resources. So to incentivize those resources, changes would need to be made to the uh, wholesale electricity markets and uh, the region's market participants are considering a variety of changes, some aimed at the energy market, some aimed at the capacity market, all with the goal of promoting clean energy resources through the markets, through market mechanisms. So what are the public policy goals that I'm, that I'm speaking of exactly? Well, the two primary goals are the state's renewable portfolio standard goals and the greenhouse gas reduction goals. On the uh, left side of the slide, you can see the RPS requirements for class one or new renewable energy by the year 2020. Um, renewable portfolio standard goals or renewable energy standard goals, they require the region's electricity providers to um, source an increasing percentage of their retail electricity sales using renewable energy, like wind and solar, um, fuel cells, geothermal, and others, depending on the state. And this, uh, this graphic here on the, on the left side of the slide shows the class one or new renewable energy goals by 2020. Uh, Rhode Island's looking to achieve 14% by 2020, and they actually just extended their renewable energy standard this past session. Uh, that will increase to 38.5% by 2035. Vermont is a slightly different animal. They recognize new and existing renewable energy and are also unique in classifying large-scale hydro as renewable, which is why they have a, a much larger percentage requirement as in their state. Um, on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the state's greenhouse gas reduction requirements. And all six states have requirements in place to reduce greenhouse gas emissions economy-wide by roughly 80% by 2050. So no small task, um, no small task for the New England states. And many of the states um, are starting to enact legislation to require their electric utilities to sign long-term contracts with uh, renewable energy facilities 
uh, in an effort to achieve some of these goals. And, and those out-of-market contracts and the revenues associated with them are bumping up against some market rules within the region's wholesale electricity markets, which is why these discussions are being had. So there's been three meetings so far in the NEPL IMAP uh, initiative. Uh, the first meeting was on August 11th, called Idea Day, where market participants uh, presented their high-level proposals for potential wholesale electricity market changes. Uh, two meetings have been held since then to refine these proposals, and there are two additional meetings um, scheduled for October and November. Uh, NEPL's goal is ultimately to develop a uh, framework document by December 2nd to provide guidance to the ISO on potential market rule changes that can be made to incentivize these resources through market forces. And um, really, the, uh, at this stage, the ISO's role has been to monitor these discussions. Um, we plan to weigh in uh, later this fall, probably by the November time frame, with our thoughts on some of these proposals. And I encourage you to see the, the NEPL website, and the ISO has a website as well dedicated to um, these proposals and um, showing you exactly what's being discussed within the NEPL stakeholder process. Moving on to my, my second update, I'd like to give you a, a quick update on the upcoming core capacity auction, that's FCA 11. Um, for those of you who um, aren't as familiar with the board capacity auction, I'll just give you a, a, a quick overview. The board capacity market features uh, an annual auction which procures the capacity resources needed to meet the region's installed capacity requirement um, in three years from now. So the installed capacity requirement is basically an estimate of the amount of installed capacity that's needed to meet the demand for electricity in the region in three years' time. So this, um, this annual auction procures the resources that are needed, and these resources can be supply-side resources or demand-side resources like energy efficiency. They can be new resources, existing resources, any resources that, that qualify for the auction, participate in the auction, and clear in the auction um, are assigned what's called a capacity supply obligation, obligating them to be there and be available to the ISO to deliver electricity in three years' time. So the ISO, of course, administers uh, a day ahead in real-time energy market to make sure we have the energy supplies we need each and every day, but what do we do to ensure resources are there in three years' time? Well, that's the purpose of the forward capacity market and these annual auctions to procure those resources. The auction also provides a long-term commitment for any new resources that clear in the auction, and that's certainly to encourage investment in, in new capacity resources. Planning is uh, well underway for FCA 11. The ISO has a uh, process in place for determining each and every year the uh, number and boundaries of capacity zones as conditions change in the region. And uh, capacity zones, this is, a, this is a locational market, so capacity zones are, are really meant to attract resources in the right areas of the region um, where there's a potential shortfall of resources um, those capacity zones are, are intended to, to capture those um, to, to capture those conditions and attract resources resources in the correct location. Uh, this year's testing um, of the topology of the system and um, you know the transmission system has led to a determination that there's going to be three capacity zones modeled in the auction for FCA 11. There will be a northern New England capacity zone, which will include. New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine. There will be a southeastern New England capacity zone, which will include Nina Boston and Seymour, Rhode Island. And finally, there will be a rest of pool capacity zone to encompass the remaining regions, which are uh, western central Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, the northern New England capacity zone is what's called import, I'm sorry, export constraint, meaning they have Challenges, there are challenges associated with moving power outside those regions into other areas of the system um, due to transmission constraints. The southeastern New England capacity zone is classified as a import constrained zone, which means there are challenges associated with moving power into that zone. These zones will be voted on by the, these zonal determinations as well as the installed capacity requirement value calculations will be voted on by the Equal Reliability Committee in September, and that will be followed by a vote 
by the participants committee in October. Sorry. After that, uh, the ISO in November will file um, all of these details with FERC as it does every year um, through a pre-FCA informational filing. That will be done in, um, in early November. And um, FCA 11, as I mentioned, is scheduled to take place February of 2017 to procure the capacity resources needed during the, the June 1, 2020 to May 31st, 2021 capacity commitment period. Finally, I'd, I'd like to give you a quick update on, on wholesale electricity costs. We show this slide at just about every meeting, and while it's not pretty to look at, it does provide all of the wholesale electricity costs for the region going back to 2008. Um, in 2015, you can see that wholesale electricity costs totaled $9.3 billion. That includes the costs associated with the wholesale electricity markets, the costs associated with transmission, and the costs associated with running the ISO. At the last meeting, we were asked to provide a breakdown of that number by state. Um, and that request came from the CLG Coordinating Committee, which we, we always like to accommodate. So we projected this slide at the last meeting, and these are just the 2015 wholesale electricity costs broken out by state. We were also asked to provide forward, um, or I'm sorry, future forward capacity market costs and future transmission costs. So we work to provide those numbers for you, and of course we don't know what energy market costs will be going into the future or what ancillary services costs will be going into the future, but we do know what forward capacity market costs will be because we know the results of the most recent forward capacity auctions. Um, so this slide here shows you future forward capacity market costs going out to the year 2020. Um, and I will just remind you that these are annualized forward capacity market costs. Uh, so they do account for two separate auctions, uh, two separate capacity commitment periods, because of course the capacity, capacity commitment period starts June 1 and ends the following May 31st. So uh, these costs really have, have for the, since the start of the auction, have been in the range of $1 to $1.5 billion. But you can see those costs going up over time. As you all may remember, the uh, costs associated with FCA 8 uh, were $8 billion, FCA 9, $4 billion, and FCA 10, $3 billion. Um, so you can see that you know, the costs for um, FCA 8, 9, 10 uh, really coming into play there. Uh, I will note that the costs for 2020, of course, are only half the picture because we've only run FCA 10, which accounts for the 2019 to 2020 capacity commitment period. So once we run FCA 11, which accounts for the 2020 to 2021 capacity commitment period, we'll have a full picture of what costs will be um, in the 2020 range. And these are future estimated costs. They may, uh, they may shift as uh, we get closer to the capacity commitment period, but this is an indication of, of where costs lie coming out of the, the primary auctions. And finally, I, I want to give you an update on future estimated transmission costs. And these costs are based on the forecasted RNS rates that the transmission owners presented uh, this past summer. So RNS rates, regional network service rates, are the rates that TOs charge to recover their costs associated with owning, maintaining, and upgrading their equipment. And each summer, the TOs uh, present their forecasted RNS rates for the next five years. So we've taken those rates um, and projected them forward. And uh, here you can see, you know, steadily increasing transmission costs going into the future. I've again, carried over the, the 2015 costs. So that's um, that's of course set in stone, like the last slide. Um, but I did want to provide you with these forecasted. Um, an estimated transmission cost based on those RNS rates that the, that the TOs uh, presented this past summer. And I will say that the RNS rates, the ISO has no role in setting those rates or approving those rates. Um, the ISO simply acts as um, a clearinghouse collecting transmission, um, transmission costs from transmission customers and handing them over to the transmission owners and really just serving as the settlement function that the ISO provides to all market participants. Those rates are ultimately filed by the TOs down with FERC for review and approval, and that's, um, so that's certainly out of the, the ISO's hands. But with that, I uh, just want to see if there are any questions. I'm supposed to end at 145, but I'm happy to take a, a few questions if you have any.
that clear, was it? <laughs> There's got to be a couple of questions out there, I'm sure. Don't be afraid to ask them. There. There we go. <coughs> Uh, the question I have is I'm looking at the transmission costs going up and uh, I'm thinking that there are probably two parts to that. One is uh, replacing aging transmission and the other is uh, building new transmission because, you know, we have more wind turbines in the north now and less nuclear plants in the south and all that. So well, could you give an estimate of uh, what percentage is replacement and what percentage is new or is that really kind of too complicated a question for a right question like this i think it may be i i couldn't tell you exactly what percentage are replacing old infrastructure and what's new transmission um i could say that these are rates um the large majority maybe 97 percent of these represent the um you know the rns rates that the transmission uh, owners have forecasted and um, the other three percent or so are some reliability services that are baked into the transmission tariff. So those costs are also included in here, but the, the majority are the RNS rates that the, that the TOs are responsible for. But I'm, I apologize if I don't know the breakdown in terms of upgrades. I, I didn't mean to ask an impossible question. I was just seeing this rise and trying to figure out what was causing it. Oh, no problem. And I can look into that for you for sure. One last question. Yeah, a great presentation. Just a, a quick, uh, any update on the ISO's winter reliability program or paper performance? Well, I believe the um, the winter planning for the winter reliability program for this upcoming winter is uh, is is already taking place. I know we have some updated information available on our on our website in the windows of time that um, that participants must show their interest in participating for those programs. So I can direct you to our our website where we actually have updated information on all of that data. One last question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, are all these uh, <coughs> slides on the website? Yes, they are. Yep. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. We'll take a 15-minute break and, and transition to our panel.